I was talk, uh, asked to speak to my children's, uh, my son's school as we approached the Gulf War in 1991. And there had been a lot of publicity that the Iraqis uh, were masters of field fortification, so-called field entrenchment, during the Iran War with Iran, which we had supported both sides, actually. Encouraged Saddam to attack Iran, and then given targeting information to each side against the other, including uh, the materials for poison gas in some cases. So we've sort of been uh, deeply involved in that one, even before we sent our troops over, but <coughs> in the Iran, Iraq war. I had been a Marine uh, platoon leader, infantry platoon leader, and a rifle company commander uh, in peacetime in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. But I, and then I used that uh, training and training I'd given as a battalion operations uh, training officer in Vietnam where I was a civilian. And I walked with troops there, having had this training, knew what I was doing in the field, and saw combat up there fairly close. So I had that experience, low-level experience. When I saw the entrenchments that the Iraqis had where they're in their positions in Kuwait, which they had invaded in 1921, which involved field after field of barbed wire trenches, deep slit trenches, very hard to kill people in, in trenches, actually, as they found in World War I. And, uh, but you know, nuclear weapons would do it. Uh, the idea, a Marine's actually, a Marine was going to be sent up north, the coast, against those fortifications. And as a former infantry officer in peacetime, but also who had been in Vietnam, it made my blood run cold to think of how it would be like World War I, you know, that, well, let's go over the top, men, into the barbed wire and against the machine guns and the artillery coming down and just suicidal. And uh, uh, I, I actually, I, I felt very, very dismayed at the thought that we were going to attack those positions head on. And in fact, what actually happened was that uh, they had planned to do that, but instead, Schwarzkopf devised what they call the Hail uh, Mary maneuver. They moved people very far, uh, flanking the other side, and came on them from the other side. So they didn't make a frontal attack on the end. What just came into my head, because it, it relates to the subject of this evening, I think, a great deal, is this fact. They did have a device for dealing with the troops in the trenches. They bulldozed the trenches with huge bulldozers, and they buried the people alive. I mean, they, we, the Americans did that. Now, that was a tactic I had not learned in, in infantry school. Exactly. And as I say, the thought of going, charging, bayonets fixed and so forth, charging those people was blood-curdling. But something about, there were even pictures of the arms and legs sticking out of these trenches that had been buried alive by bulldozers. Okay, the subject here is, how do people come to do that, or plan to do that? And the answer is, fairly easily, actually. It's something, humans are capable of being heartless, if you like, toward other humans to a degree that we just deny to ourselves. It's a denial, it's, it's not part of our identity that humans act this way in warfare. And not only in warfare, of course, but in warfare in particular. And uh, one way of summing this up, I've, I've said for a long time when we say, this is inhuman. I say, no, no other species does this. It's very human. Humane is not a synonym for human and vice versa. Human is not a synonym for humane. And uh, um, it, when I say it ties in with what we're dealing with here is, how do people come to make plans for killing, and we haven't really got to this yet, but killing, let's just say, vast numbers of other civilians? And I'm saying historically, Americans have become almost addicted to bombing because we have thought of ourselves as having, or I should say the Air Force thinks of itself, as having won a war, Second World War, with bombing. Not Germany, it took troops on the ground to do it in Germany, but uh, in Japan, uh, they feel they won the war, and especially with firebombing. LeMay, you mentioned, 
we had great misgivings about using the atom bomb at all, as did his boss, Spots, who's his superior in the Pacific, because they could see right away, how do you justify a large air force after the war when you can do the job of 300 bombers with one bomber? And that, that worried them, as a matter of fact. But the idea was, and the Americans didn't quite start that, the first to do it, as I tell in the book, by the way, chronologically are probably the Japanese in China. And then uh, Guernica, uh, I was just, <laughs> it's funny, I was doing an interview this morning, I was not supposed to do it, but with uh, an Italian uh, for Repubblica in Italy, and as I uh, found myself talking to them, I mentioned uh, some of this background, and I said Guernica, and I put in the little known footnote, Italians participated, Mussolini's Air Force participated in Guernica. It wasn't just the German Condor Legion. I wonder how many of their readers would have picked that one up before. But anyway, the, the deliberate destruction, of course, is depicted by Picasso in his uh, painting, Guernica, of the, actually remember, the, what, what is the scene of a bull rearing, you know, in, in fear and anger. And I believe there are sort of limbs, separate limbs that you see in the course of this. Well, the Nazis did it. They did it in the London Blitz, straight terror bombing. But people in the RAF had long been waiting for the ability to use their bombers in just that fashion. And they found the German use of it liberating for them. Uh, as a matter of fact, weren't, what, yeah, the Liberator bomber, that was a US bomber, I think, right? B-24. But uh, we, they did it immediately then afterwards. They found that for just operational reasons, they couldn't fly during the day. Too many of them shot, got, got shot down on British bombers. They weren't able to fly high enough and have enough. They didn't have enough armament. They were getting shot down. They had to go at night. At night, you couldn't pick out, you were asking now what kind of target, a base or a port or a factory. In practice, our bombers with the Norton bomb site had actually rehearsed in Arizona and Texas hitting a particular corner of a factory. That's what upper sites they thought they were. Well, actually, the British discovered they had to go at night, and going at night, it was hard to find the right town, the right city, but you couldn't take a target meaningfully less than a city, or in particular, the built-up parts of a city. And to get the most effect, you used incendiaries where the, uh, wherever it landed, the fire could spread to closely packed housing and so forth. Eventually, the U.S. picked up that tactic for much the same operational reasons. Hard to bomb through clouds, through bad weather, the radar wasn't good enough, and so forth. So by the time of Tokyo then, we were, LeMay took on what his superiors wanted, which was fire bombing that would, incend, it would uh, uh, burn to death as many people as possible. And I used to think, I was four, 14 at that point, uh, that we didn't know they were really doing that. But I was very struck, and it's in the book. I, I reproduced the headlines from the first page that were rather astonishing. Uh, not only did Time Magazine at the time say, I remember this phrase, uh, I have it in the book, last night, General Curtis LeMay's firebirds demonstrated that properly kindled Japanese cities would burn like autumn leaves. Well, the cities, of course, were cities of people. Uh, but even so, I didn't see a number attached to that Japan thing, except that in May, when they went over again, they put an overestimate of how many were killed on this second wave of attacks in Tokyo. And the headline in the New York Times, which I wasn't reading then in Detroit, the headline was, one million killed. Now, that was a subheading. Not a big astonishing thing, just one million killed. And uh, in fact, they didn't describe it in the text till almost the end of the article. No protest, no questions raised in Congress, no nothing. You know. now, they, they didn't kill a million on that occasion, anything close to it. But they were able to say that, saying we had become, in a, in a certain sense, we had become depraved, simply, both the bombers and the people who accepted this. And we talked about Bataan death marks as uh, did, and in answer to your question again, what was Truman's announcement when he first announced the bomb? 
Last night we bombed a military base, Hiroshima, a military base. Well, there was a military base in Hiroshima, Hiroshima, but it was at the edge of the town. It was not damaged, it was not targeted. The target was the center of the town. And uh, it was days, I understand, reading the history, before people really understood there was a city associated with that military base. Actually, the city was the target. I'm saying, if you understand this, you can understand how the Air Force went ahead then, uh, building bombers and making plans for the purpose of incinerating many, many, many people.